Chapter 45 The Fall of Jericho This chapter is based on Joshua 5, 13-15, and chapter 6, and chapter 7. The Hebrews had entered Canaan, but they had not subdued it. And to human appearance, the struggle to gain possession of the land must be long and difficult. It was inhabited by a powerful race who stood ready to oppose the invasion of their territory. The various tribes were bound together by the fear of a common danger. Their horses and iron battle chariots, their knowledge of the country, and their training in war would give them great advantage. Furthermore, the country was guarded by fortresses, cities great and fenced up to heaven. Deuteronomy chapter 9 verse 1. Only in the assurance of a strength not their own could the Israelites hope for success in the impending conflict. One of the strongest fortresses in the land, the large and wealthy city of Jericho, lay just before them, but a little distance from their camp at Gilgal. On the border of a fertile plain, abounding with the rich and varied productions of the tropics, its palaces and temples, the abode of luxury and vice, this proud city, behind its massive battlements, offered defiance to the God of Israel. Jericho was one of the principal seats of idol worship, being especially devoted to Ashtaroth, the goddess of the moon. Here centered all that was vilest and most degrading in the religion of the Canaanites. The people of Israel, in whose minds were fresh the fearful results of their sin at Beth Peor, could look upon this heathen city only with disgust and horror. To reduce Jericho was seen by Joshua to be the first step in the conquest of Canaan. But first of all he sought an assurance of divine guidance, and it was granted him. Withdrawing from the encampment to meditate and to pray that the God of Israel would go before his people, he beheld an armed warrior of lofty stature and commanding presence, with his sword drawn in his hand. To Joshua's challenge, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? The answer was given, As captain of the hosts of the Lord am I now come. The same command given to Moses in Horeb, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy, reveal the true character of the mysterious stranger. It was Christ, the exalted one, who stood before the leader of Israel. Awe-stricken, Joshua fell upon his face and worshipped, and heard the assurance, I have given into thine hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. And he received instruction for the capture of the city. In obedience to the divine command, Joshua marshaled the armies of Israel. No assault was to be made. They were simply to make the circuit of the city, bearing the ark of God and blowing upon trumpets. First came the warriors, a body of chosen men, not now to conquer by their own skill and prowess, but by obedience to the directions given them from God. Seven priests with trumpets followed. Then the ark of God, surrounded by a halo of divine glory, was borne by priests clad in the dress denoting their sacred office. The army of Israel followed, each tribe under its standard. Such was the procession that compassed the doomed city. No sound was heard but the tread of that mighty host and the solemn peal of the trumpets, echoing among the hills and resounding through the streets of Jericho. The circuit completed, the army returned in silence to their tents, and the ark was restored to its place in the tabernacle. With wonder and alarm, the watchmen of the city marked every move and reported to those in authority. They knew not the meaning of all this display, but when they beheld that mighty host marching around their city once each day with the sacred ark and the attendant priests, the mystery of the scene struck terror to the hearts of priests and people. Again they would inspect their strong defenses, feeling certain they could successfully resist the most powerful attack. Many ridiculed the thought that any harm could come to them through these singular demonstrations. Others were awed as they beheld a procession that each day wound about the city. 
They remembered that the Red Sea had once parted before this people, and that a passage had just been opened for them through the River Jordan. They knew not what further wonders God might work for them. For six days the host of Israel made the circuit of the city. The seventh day came, and with the first dawn of light Joshua marshaled the armies of the Lord. Now they were directed to march seven times around Jericho, and at a mighty peal from the trumpets to shout with a loud voice, for God had given them the city. The vast army marched solemnly around the devoted walls. All was silent, save the measured tread of many feet, and the occasional sound of the trumpet breaking the stillness of the early morning. The massive walls of solid stone seemed to defy the siege of men. The watchers on the walls looked on with rising fear, as the first circuit ended, there followed a second, then a third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth. What could be the object of these mysterious movements? What mighty event was impending? They had not long to wait. As the seventh circuit was completed, the long procession paused. The trumpets, which for an interval had been silent, now broke forth in a blast that shook the very earth. The walls of solid stone, with their massive towers and battlements, tottered and heaved from their foundations, and with a crash fell in ruin to the earth. The inhabitants of Jericho were paralyzed with terror, and the hosts of Israel marched in and took possession of the city. The Israelites had not gained the victory by their own power. The conquest had been wholly the Lord's. And as the first fruits of the land, the city, with all that it contained, was to be devoted as a sacrifice to God. It was to be impressed upon Israel that in the conquest of Canaan, they were not to fight for themselves, but simply as instruments to execute the will of God, not to seek for riches or self-exaltation, but the glory of Jehovah their King. Before the capture the command had been given, The city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein. Keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed and make the camp of Israel a curse, and trouble it. All the inhabitants of the city, with every living thing that it contained, both man and woman, young and old, and ox and sheep and ass, were put to the sword. Only faithful Rahab, with her household, was spared, in fulfillment of the promise of the spies. The city itself was burned, its palaces and temples, its magnificent dwellings with all their luxurious appointments, the rich draperies and the costly garments were given to the flames. That which could not be destroyed by fire, the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and of iron, was to be devoted to the service of the tabernacle. The very site of the city was accursed. Jericho was never to be rebuilt as a stronghold. Judgments were threatened upon anyone who should presume to restore the walls that divine power had cast down. The solemn declaration was made in the presence of all Israel, Cursed be the man before the Lord, that riseth up and buildeth this city Jericho. He shall lay the foundation thereof in his firstborn, and in his youngest son shall he set up the gates of it. The utter destruction of the people of Jericho was but a fulfillment of the commands previously given through Moses concerning the inhabitants of Canaan. Thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 2 Of the cities of these people, thou shalt save alive nothing that breatheth. Deuteronomy chapter 20 verse 16 To many, these commands seem to be contrary to the spirit of love and mercy enjoined in other portions of the Bible. But they were, in truth, the dictates of infinite wisdom and goodness. God was about to establish Israel and Canaan, to develop among them a nation and government that should be a manifestation of His kingdom upon the earth. They were not only to be inheritors of the true religion, but to disseminate its principles throughout the world. The Canaanites had abandoned themselves to the foulest and most debasing heathenism, 
and it was necessary that the land should be cleared of what would so surely prevent the fulfillment of God's gracious purposes. The inhabitants of Canaan had been granted ample opportunity for repentance. Forty years before, the opening of the Red Sea and the judgments upon Egypt had testified to the supreme power of the God of Israel. And now, the overthrow of the kings of Midian, of Gilead, and Bashan had further shown that Jehovah was above all gods. The holiness of his character and his abhorrence of impurity had been evinced in the judgments visited upon Israel for their participation in the abominable rites at Baal Peor. All these events were known to the inhabitants of Jericho, and there were many who shared Rahab's conviction, though they refused to obey it, that Jehovah, the God of Israel, is God in heaven above and upon the earth beneath. Like the men before the flood, the Canaanites lived only to blaspheme heaven and defile the earth. And both love and justice demanded the prompt execution of these rebels against God and foes to man. How easily the armies of heaven brought down the walls of Jericho, that proud city whose bulwarks forty years before had struck terror to the unbelieving spies. The mighty one of Israel had said, I have given into thine hand Jericho. Against that word, human strength was powerless. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 30 the captain of the Lord's host communicated only with Joshua. He did not reveal himself to all the congregation, and it rested with them to believe or doubt the words of Joshua, to obey the commands given by him in the name of the Lord, or to deny his authority. They could not see the host of angels who attended them under the leadership of the Son of God. They might have reasoned, what unmeaning movements are these, and how ridiculous the performance of marching daily around the walls of the city, blowing trumpets of ram's horns. This can have no effect upon those towering fortifications. But the very plan of continuing this ceremony, through so long a time prior to the final overthrow of the walls, afforded opportunity for the development of faith among the Israelites. It was to be impressed upon their minds that their strength was not in the wisdom of man, nor in his might, but only in the God of their salvation. They were thus to become accustomed to relying wholly upon their divine leader. God will do great things for those who trust in him. The reason why his professed people have no greater strength is that they trust so much to their own wisdom and do not give the Lord an opportunity to reveal His power in their behalf. He will help His believing children in every emergency if they will place their entire confidence in Him and faithfully obey Him. Soon after the fall of Jericho, Joshua determined to attack Ai, a small town among the ravines a few miles to the west of the Jordan Valley. Spies sent to this place brought back the report that the inhabitants were but few, and that only a small force would be needed to overthrow it. The great victory that God had gained for them had made the Israelites self-confident. Because He had promised them the land of Canaan, they felt secure, and failed to realize that divine help alone could give them success. Even Joshua laid his plans for the conquest of Ai without seeking counsel from God. The Israelites had begun to exalt their own strength and to look with contempt upon their foes. An easy victory was expected, and three thousand men were thought sufficient to take the place. These rushed to the attack without the assurance that God would be with them. They advanced nearly to the gate of the city only to encounter the most determined resistance. Panic-stricken at the numbers and thorough preparation of their enemies, they fled in confusion down the steep descent. The Canaanites were in hot pursuit. They chased them from before the gate and smote them in the going down. Though the loss was small as to numbers, but thirty-six men being slain, the defeat was disheartening to the whole congregation. 
the hearts of the people melted and became as water. This was the first time they had met the Canaanites in actual battle, and if put to flight before the defenders of this little town, what would be the result in the greater conflicts before them? Joshua looked upon their ill success as an expression of God's displeasure, and in distress and apprehension he rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the eventide, he and the elders of Israel, and put dust upon their heads. Alas, O Lord God, he cried, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan, to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us? O Lord, what shall I say, when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it, and shall environ us around, and cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do unto thy great name? The answer from Jehovah was, Get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel hath transgressed my covenant which I commanded them. It was a time for prompt and decided action, and not for despair and lamentation. There was secret sin in the camp, and it must be searched out and put away before the presence and blessing of the Lord could be with his people. Neither will I be with you any more, except ye destroy that accursed from among you. God's command had been disregarded by one of those appointed to execute his judgments, and the nation was held accountable for the guilt of the transgressor. They have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and dissembled also. Instruction was given to Joshua for the discovery and punishment of the criminal. The lot was to be employed for the detection of the guilty. The sinner was not directly pointed out, the matter being left in doubt for a time, that the people might feel their responsibility for the sins existing among them, and thus be led to searching of heart and humiliation before God. Early in the morning, Joshua gathered the people together by their tribes, and the solemn and impressive ceremony began. Step by step the investigation went on. Closer and still closer came the fearful test. First the tribe, then the family, then the household, then the man was taken. And Achan, the son of Carmi, of the tribe of Judah, was pointed out by the finger of God as the troubler of Israel. To establish his guilt beyond all question, leaving no ground for the charge that he had been unjustly condemned, Joshua solemnly adjured Achan to acknowledge the truth. The wretched man made full confession of his crime. Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment, and two hundred shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold of fifty shekels weight, then I coveted them, and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent. Messengers were immediately dispatched to the tent, where they removed the earth at the place specified, and behold, it was hid in his tent, and the silver under it. And they took them out of the midst of the tent, and brought them unto Joshua, and laid them out before the Lord. Sentence was pronounced and immediately executed. Why hast thou troubled us? said Joshua. The Lord shall trouble thee this day. As the people had been held responsible for Achan's sin, and had suffered from its consequences, they were, through their representatives, to take part in his punishment. All Israel stoned him with stones. Then there was raised over him a great pile of stones, a witness to the sin and its punishment. Wherefore, the name of that place was called the Valley of Achor, that is, Trouble. In the book of Chronicles, his memorial is written, Achar, the Troubler of Israel. 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 7. Achan's sin was committed in defiance of the most direct and solemn warnings and the most mighty manifestations of God's power. Keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed, had been the proclamation to all Israel. The command was given immediately after the miraculous passage of the Jordan, 
and the recognition of God's covenant by the circumcision of the people, after the observance of the Passover, and the appearance of the angel of the covenant, the captain of the Lord's host. It had been followed by the overthrow of Jericho, giving evidence of the destruction which will surely overtake all transgressors of God's law. The fact that divine power alone had given the victory to Israel, that they had not come into possession of Jericho by their own strength, gave solemn weight to the command, prohibiting them from partaking of the spoils. God, by the might of his own word, had overthrown this stronghold. The conquest was his, and to him alone the city with all that it contained was to be devoted. Of the millions of Israel, there was but one man who, in that solemn hour of triumph and of judgment, had dared to transgress the command of God. Achan's covetousness was excited by the sight of that costly robe of Shinar. Even when it had brought him face to face with death, he called it a goodly Babylonish garment. One sin had led to another, and he appropriated the gold and silver devoted to the treasury of the Lord. He robbed God of the first fruits of the land of Canaan. The deadly sin that led to Achan's ruin had its root in covetousness, of all sins one of the most common and the most lightly regarded. While other offenses meet with detection and punishment, how rarely does the violation of the Tenth Commandment so much as call forth censure? The enormity of this sin and its terrible results are the lessons of Achan's history. Covetousness is an evil of gradual development. Achan had cherished greed of gain until it became a habit, binding him in fetters well nigh impossible to break. While fostering this evil, he would have been filled with horror at the thought of bringing disaster upon Israel. But his perceptions were deadened by sin, and when temptation came, he fell an easy prey. Are not similar sins still committed, in the face of warnings as solemn and explicit? We are as directly forbidden to indulge covetousness as was Achan to appropriate the spoils of Jericho. God has declared it to be idolatry. We are warned, Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Take heed and beware of covetousness. Luke chapter 12, verse 15. Let it not be once named among you. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3. We have before us the fearful doom of Achan, of Judas, of Ananias, and Sapphira. Back of all these we have that of Lucifer, the son of the morning, who, coveting a higher state, forfeited forever the brightness and bliss of heaven. And yet, notwithstanding all these warnings, covetousness abounds. Everywhere its slimy track is seen. It creates discontent and dissension in families. It excites envy and hatred in the poor against the rich. It prompts the grinding oppression of the rich toward the poor. And this evil exists not in the world alone, but in the church. How common even here to find selfishness, avarice, overreaching, neglect of charities, and robbery of God in tithes and offerings. Among church members in good and regular standing, there are, alas, many Achans. Many a man comes stately to church and sits at the table of the Lord, while among his possessions are hidden unlawful gains, the things that God has cursed. For a goodly Babylonian garment, multitudes sacrifice the approval of conscience and their hope of heaven. Multitudes barter their integrity and their capabilities for usefulness for a bag of silver shekels. The cries of the suffering poor are unheeded. The gospel light is hindered in its course. The scorn of worldlings is kindled by practices that give the lie to the Christian profession. And yet, the covetous professor continues to heap up treasures. 
Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. Malachi chapter 3 verse 8, saith the Lord. Achan's sin brought disaster upon the whole nation. For one man's sin, the displeasure of God will rest upon his church till the transgression is searched out and put away. The influence most to be feared by the church is not that of open opposers, infidels, and blasphemers, but of inconsistent professors of Christ. These are the ones that keep back the blessing of the God of Israel and bring weakness upon his people. When the church is in difficulty, when coldness and spiritual declension exist, giving occasion for the enemies of God to triumph, then, instead of folding their hands and lamenting their unhappy state, let its members inquire if there is not an Achan in the camp. With humiliation and searching of heart, let each seek to discover the hidden sins that shut out God's presence. Achan acknowledged his guilt, but when it was too late for the confession to benefit himself. He had seen the armies of Israel return from Ai defeated and disheartened, yet he did not come forward and confess his sin. He had seen Joshua and the elders of Israel bowed to the earth in grief too great for words. Had he then made confession, he would have given some proof of true penitence, but he still kept silence. He had listened to the proclamation that a great crime had been committed, and had even heard its character definitely stated. But his lips were sealed. Then came the solemn investigation. How his soul thrilled with terror as he saw his tribe pointed out, then his family and his household. But still he uttered no confession, until the finger of God was placed upon him. Then, when his sin could no longer be concealed, he admitted the truth. How often are similar confessions made? There is a vast difference between admitting facts after they have been proved and confessing sins known only to ourselves and to God. Achan would not have confessed had he not hoped by so doing to avert the consequences of his crime. But his confession only served to show that his punishment was just. There was no genuine repentance for sin, no contrition, no change of purpose, no abhorrence of evil. So confessions will be made by the guilty when they stand before the bar of God after every case has been decided for life or death, the consequences to result to himself will draw from each an acknowledgment of his sin. It will be forced from the soul by an awful sense of condemnation and a fearful looking for of judgment. But such confessions cannot save the sinner. So long as they can conceal their transgressions from their fellow men, Many, like Achan, feel secure and flatter themselves that God will not be strict to mark iniquity. All too late their sins will find them out in that day when they shall not be purged with sacrifice or offering forever. When the records of heaven shall be opened, the judge will not in words declare to man his guilt, but will cast one penetrating, convicting glance, and every deed every transaction of life will be vividly impressed upon the memory of the wrongdoer. The person will not, as in Joshua's day, need to be hunted out from tribe to family, but his own lips will confess his shame. The sins hidden from the knowledge of men will then be proclaimed to the whole world.